part of this evening. We're not going to be here very long. I just uh, sensed a real prompting from the Lord to uh, be in our building tonight as we begin our, what I call our sacred new year. You know, in the nation of Israel, uh, they operate by two calendars, one that begins around the Passover time and then the one that begins around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And for us, this is uh, our, uh, our sacred new year. That's what it was called for them. We thank the Lord for what he's brought us through, what he's done, and this is the first day in our new year, and we bless God for just the privilege, right, to be a part of what he wants to do in the St. Louis region, in this in this area. I want to uh, just share with you briefly uh, a little bit of how the Lord birthed us, and then I want to also kind of bring it up today to where some of where I see that we are by the help of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, I want to remind you of our commitment to the Lord, what we're going to do the remainder of this year and the moving forward in the purposes of God. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter um, 4. Luke, chapter 4. I'm going to look at verse 43, but I will actually start uh, around verse 40. If you recall from Luke chapter 4 that this is a time when uh, Jesus had been in the wilderness fasting and praying for 40 days, 40 nights, and uh, then he was commissioned and sent out uh, later into to ministry uh, earlier in the chapter the bible says after that fast he returned in the power of the spirit there's a real uh, connection here that we cannot afford to miss and that is that in order to return to where you came from better there has to be an ascendancy over the temptation of the of the, of the flesh and uh, from the enemy in every aspect of our lives. And notice here, earlier in the chapter, the Bible says to us that Jesus actually did that. Uh, many scholars relate uh, the, the message that John the Apostle gave in 1 John, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, to those three areas of victory that Jesus won. Uh, where he was tempted by the devil to make stone into bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was Jesus' weapon against the temptation. It was the written word of God. And then when he was also challenged, uh, having been taken up, the scripture says, into a high mountain, and he looked and he saw many of the kingdoms of the world uh, Satan, I believe, thinking that that's really what Jesus wanted. He wanted worship. Uh, and uh, he, he, he decided that he was going to offer to Jesus, without the cross, he was going to offer to Jesus the allegiance and the loyalty of the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus' response uh, to Satan was, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Very, very important, very important observation there in that passage. What is that? That's, that's victory over, really, the pride of life, right? The pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And Scripture goes on to say that he was told to throw himself down and create a spectacle in which God would be obligated, obligated uh, to, um, to protect him, right? Uh, to be there for him. Uh, I don't know how many times you may have been in a situation like that where, where you did something or someone did something to force you uh, to help them. And really it was, uh, it was, it would have been tempting the Lord to partner with Satan 
uh, in, a, in an evil scheme. Satan, the Bible says, actually quoted a portion of Psalm 91 to get him to do that. And Jesus, of course, seeing through the deception, understanding that this would be a misapplication, a wrong application of scripture, responds and says, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Uh, some refer to that as the lust of the eyes, the eyes being metaphorical or symbolic of the understanding, what I see how I interpret things. And so in every single one of those temptations, Jesus mastered, he, he excelled victoriously over what Satan was trying to get him to do, to give in to just the fleshly longing and yearning to eat. The body needs to eat. Secondly, to uh, elicit from the world a kind of worshipful response in a manner that God the Father did not send him to do, the pride of life. And then finally, finally, uh, to misapply the scriptures through misinterpretation of what it really means. A misunderstanding of the word can lead to disobedience to the will of God. And in this sense, submission to the temptation of the lust of the eye. And so the Bible says, having won that victory, uh, the devil ended every temptation. He departed from him until an opportune season or an opportune time. The Greek term there for time is the word kairos. It is a, a, a clearly established moment or season in which God does or brings to fulfillment what he wanted to do. Satan was looking for an opportune season to overthrow Jesus. And the very next verse says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Victory, in this sense, is not just a new camel, a new mule, a house. Uh, it certainly was not the adulation of the crowd. Uh, it was not people bowing at his feet in the wrong way. Uh, it wasn't that at all, was it? Victory was evident in his life because he overcame the temptation of the enemy. And now he could freely flow in the anointing of God, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, when there's victory over the temptation of the enemy, the understanding of the believer in Jesus is clearer. Discernment is more accurate. There's a posture of submission in the heart, not only to what God says, but also to what God means and to the timing of God and to do whatever God wants God's way. In other words, we begin to see things the way God sees them. And we do what God says do his way. He did not come to win the attention of the world through simple, powerful acts. He did not come to win the allegiance of the world, certainly by bowing in a secret agreement with the devil. He certainly did not come to win the affection and the allegiance of the world by forcing God into a situation where he would have to save him from killing himself. Indeed, those things would occur in the power of the Spirit. So he returned in the power of the Holy Spirit to Galilee and news of him went out through all the surrounding region and he taught in their synagogues. Synagogue meetings were places and meetings for study of the word and prayer. The New Testament church built upon that model for what we now call local church services. They were Jewish. And so the, the purpose for those gatherings 
was not as much evangelistic as they were edificational for those who are already in covenant relationship with God. He taught this would be the way that the part of the way that the, that the will of the Father would be manifested and that it would be fulfilled in his life. He taught them in the synagogues being glorified by all. And so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Many, of course, know that the, the readings through the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im of the prophets, and the Ketubim, the writings, the Psalms, the Proverbs, was put on a schedule. He was handed the book of Isaiah. Some believe that it was prescribed for that day for him to read. Others say no, just as a guest in the synagogue. Sometimes they would allow a guest brother to give exhortations. We're not quite certain which it was. I, at least I'm not. If you go back in history, you might be able to find out. But he turned to this passage in Isaiah. There are about 18 prayers that went on, some of them by recitation and some of them just by by just extemporaneously praying in the synagogue service. And there was also time to allow a guest to speak or someone who was not a part of the priesthood to talk and give exhortation. This is how Paul was able to start amongst the Jewish synagogues when he went from town to town. As a guest, he would be allowed a moment to speak. The Spirit of God would minister. You know the rest of the story. Sometimes he was kicked out because he spoke of Jesus Christ and his burial and his resurrection. And many thought of him as, an, as a traitor, Jesus as an imposter, as a liar. Nonetheless, that was the method. So Jesus reads from this text, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is a prophecy about the Messiah, the Mashiach in the Hebrew term. To preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to heal the broken order, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Why, they knew Many of them knew, most of them perhaps knew that that was a messianic passage. What was he going to say? And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You understand the impact of those words when he made that statement. He was in effect saying, the fulfillment of this passage is taking place today. I'm the guy. Have you been waiting for something a long, long time? I mean a long time, not just a couple of months or a year or a decade or two, but I mean a long time. Not even just a generation. But for centuries. And then someone walks in and says, okay, it's here. It's happening. If we're honest, most of us will scratch our heads and try to figure out what tests we need to apply to make sure we're not being duped and played and deceived. And so Jesus, of course, understands that. Verse 22 says, so all bore witness to him and marveled at something that we don't really hear, at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. So he said more. The scripture literally says in the verse before that, he closed the book and verse 21, he began to say, today this scripture is being fulfilled. And then he said something else. The only thing we hear about it is that it was gracious. It was graciously disseminated, not, not rudely, 
not pridefully, but graciously, not insensitively, but graciously. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. You, you, you sense the, the change in tone? <laughs> Rather than, oh, wow, wonderful, it's happening. We've been waiting on this for centuries. We get to live in the generation where, where it's really happening. No, prove to us by working a miracle that you're the Messiah. He said, surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country, but I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a, a widow you remember that story, right? What's Jesus' point? His point is, is that a Sidonian would recognize him, but not you. Uh, verse 27, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the successor to Elijah, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman or Naaman, the Syrian. Yeah, it's Jewish people. Why, uh, why, why was there no Jew healed? Hmm? Jesus is driving at something here. They, 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 you've been waiting for centuries for the fulfillment, really, for millennia, for the fulfillment of the word that the Lord gave to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Moses. And this word is in your midst being fulfilled, but you don't see it. That's why you told me to work a miracle. Nothing wrong with the working of miracles. Obviously, the Lord uses them as signs to attest to the fact that he is Lord. Yeah, that's, that's true, but can you feel it? Can you sense it? Jesus is driving at something else. You are not discerning. You're using the manifestation of a miracle as your standard for determining whether or not I am who I say I am. You notice in the word of the Lord early when Jesus is ministering, uh, later, and others come to him demanding, is the Greek, a sign. You know, Jesus says, no sign will be given to this adulterous generation. What's the problem? Doesn't he have the power? Yes, he has the power, but miracles are not worked as a result of adulterously motivated <laughs> demands. What's an adulterer? Someone who is willing to break covenant and not honor covenant. And God in effect, Christ in effect is saying no sign will be given. No miracle will be worked as a result of the demand from an adulterous heart. You're not with me. You're not for me. You don't see me for who I am. You hear of Jesus later in the book of Revelation, he that hath, to the churches he says this, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Not just see the miracles he does in the churches. Let him hear. Faith comes by hearing, not just seeing. 
Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. There's been healings in your name. Depart from me. I never knew you. Yeah, the point is that Christ is he's, he's nudging and pulling on them to respond based upon what they are seeing and understanding in the spirit. Not merely a miracle. Whether it's by sleight of hand magic or really the work of a demon pretending to really work a miracle, no demon can really work a miracle. We can be easily duped. But there is, there is no, there is no, there is no substitute for the witness of the Holy Spirit when it's really God. That's where we respond in faith. We've been convinced by the Spirit of God. Well, when he told these stories, it was clear. You're looking for a sign. You want a sign. Well, in Sidon, it, was, it wasn't a Jewish lady. And, and, and it was a Syrian that got healed and under Elisha. What was the response? Thank you for showing us this, Jesus. Look at verse 28. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with joy, with wrath, and rose up and threw him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. He returned in the power of the Spirit, but they didn't see it. They never discerned. How did you try to murder the one who's returned in the power of the Spirit? If you see it. And he came to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on Sabbaths. They were astonished at his teaching for his word, his word. Notice there again, no healing yet. His word was with authority. At the risk of sounding like I'm downplaying healing, I don't at all mean to do that. Obviously, the emphasis tonight is he's driving at a point. In the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in the midst, it came out of him did not hurt him. Luke chapter 11, Jesus tells us that when you see this kind of a display, it's the finger of God. This is a, this is a sign to you that the kingdom of God is in your midst. The overthrow of the demonic power and activity of the demon, of Satan and demons, can only take place through the finger of God. And when it happens, kingdom order comes into chaos at the most vital level, at a spiritual level, not just an intellectual level or an emotional level, at a spiritual dimension to set people truly free. And they were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is or what a teaching this is for with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. The next passage, the scripture says that he heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. 
Now he rose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house, but Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they, and they, they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Now to the part that we were going to start with, and I close. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. All those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them and demons came out of many crying out and saying you are the Christ the son of God and he rebuking them did not allow them to speak why because one of the reasons could very easily be the word of a demon is not always understood to be proof. Even though we know from scripture and from the life of Christ that it is. Uh, their purpose for, the demon's purpose for crying out and saying who he was, was to incite rebellion and eventually lead to his death. Eventually it did, but that was the purpose for it. No demon calls Jesus Christ in submission to his lordship. A demon calls Jesus Christ because he's been forced to. You must obey. Demons must obey. They must. They must. And so his lordship was acknowledged. You are the Christ, the son of God. And he rebuking them did not allow them to speak for they knew that he, they knew he was the Christ even if others didn't. And when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and began and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, and uh, when I was a little boy, after I got saved, probably I'm thinking, maybe I wasn't that small, maybe nine or 10 years old, uh, I would read through the gospels. And my goal was like I've been taught in church to be like Jesus. So I figured the best way to be like Jesus, I had to find out who Jesus is and what he was like. And I couldn't find that out by not reading, reading the scriptures. And this passage uh, is brought to my mind today as we uh, conclude tonight and conclude this season of um, celebration and we move into our next year. Uh, this verse contains what for me has become a major charge for my personal life, but also I've been convinced over the years for us as well here in Metro Christian Worship Center Church. He said to them, they were trying to get him to stay where he was, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose, I have been sent. It's an amazing thing to discover the reason why you were conceived and you were born. It's an amazing thing to discover even after you've been conceived and you've been born why you need to be born again. It's even greater to discover once you've been born again why you were born again. What the Lord caused your life why the Lord rather called you into existence as a new believer in Jesus Christ. Tonight, uh, as I reflect upon what the Lord has done uh, over these 37 years, and now we're entering into our 38th year, 
I was reminded, as I mentioned to you, of this particular passage of scripture, which kind of hones in on the direction that the Lord has given to us as a local church. There are some missiologists who wrote a book called Nine Worlds to Win. And one of those nine worlds they refer to as the urban world. Years before I became aware of that book and any language like that, the Lord led me to this scripture as a, as a young kid as I was praying about what uh, I should do with my life. I had also learned about Joseph and Daniel and some others. And for a while, uh, in my heart, what I desired to be was a United States Senator. I wanted to uh, grow up someday and serve in the United States government. And to do that, I was being told I should go to law school and do some other things like that. My junior year in high school, the Lord met me. I'll just put it that way, sitting in my chemistry class. I had a chemistry professor who was trying to get me to uh, uh, go into chemical engineering, some other things, and he heard about my interest in going to a, uh, a Christian school, and he really thought that was a waste of time. And the Lord spoke something to me. Uh, like most young people, I wanted to be, well, you know, successful. And so uh, for me, that included a good education and a good job one that would be would last 30, 40, 50 years, and so on. And as I sat there that day in that chemistry class, the teacher's name was Dr. Preston Ingram. I'll never forget him. And he was talking, and he was pointing to me and telling me what I could do with my life. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you can go the route that he's telling you. You'll be successful but you will not be fulfilled. And when he said that to me, I thought, I had never thought of the two things being different. If I was successful, I would be fulfilled. And if I was fulfilled, I would be successful. But that was the first time I'd heard anyone ever say, even drop a thought like that, that you could be successful and not fulfilled. And so that day, God dealt with me about it and showed me what he meant by making that statement, that I would be successful according to the world's standard of success. But the world's standard of success would not bring me fulfillment. I had to make a decision that day that I would follow through on what God wanted me to do. And I had, to, I had run from it, to be honest with you. I, I did not want to be poor. I did not want to be alone. I did not want to suffer in the way that I had uh, read about in scripture and seen. Uh, my mom was involved in a ministry through which I got saved and periodically every year since the day I got saved and even before we would go and hear missionaries tell their story. And um, I thought it was good that they did that. But I didn't want to suffer like that. And so being fulfilled didn't really register when I would hear some of their stories. That day, 16 years old, God got a hold of me and helped me to understand that being fulfilled, though it did include suffering, there would actually be no, no sense of fulfillment like it. So I said yes to God and moved forward. There are a number of other things that the Lord dealt with me about, but we're out of time tonight. This was the only thing he told me to, to read. And I want to I want to call many of you into the fulfillment that God has for your life. Our association and our joining together, if God led you here, 
our association and our joining together in covenant relationship, if God led you here, at least for this period of time, includes serving together in the urban world. And there are many statistics that we could read and go through. We're pretty much familiar with them just by virtue of the fact that we live in one or are part of it. But the most important thing that I want to end with tonight is that God has brought us together for the purpose of preaching and demonstrating the gospel of the kingdom in environments that are woefully chaotic, where there's sickness and there's disease of mind, of body, of spirit. And there's a desperate need for people who will proclaim the gospel and it will function by the guidance of the spirit under the finger of the Lord. And where the power of the enemy is broken and where uh, sick bodies can be healed and most importantly where hearts can be mended for the purpose of Jesus, there is no greater fulfillment, none whatsoever. Tonight as we close then, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna play that song if you will, Quickly, I want to ask you if you will reaffirm your commitment to the Lord. We call it E1A1TY around here. It's just another modern contemporary way of saying we're committed to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. I mentioned it Sunday. There is no greater cause on the face of the earth anywhere than a call to the advancement of the kingdom of God. There isn't one. I have the privilege and the responsibility, it's both, of uh, being one of the leaders under shepherds in that. But we together, we together, have the privilege and responsibility of being obedient to what God has called us to do. And so having said that, uh, I want to conclude then, all right? If you are willing to follow through with what God has said in your life, personally, as a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, and then secondly, congregationally, collectively with us in ministering the gospel and helping to disciple people to walk in, the, in Christ, I want to ask you to just take a moment, bow your head, and say that to the Lord. Lord, I reaffirm my commitment to be a faithful witness, a carrier of your gospel. And then after you've made that statement, I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. Bless you. Who's going to tell him there's a better way? Who's going to of the things coming on them so God can do their night today. Somebody's got a warning. Somebody's got to tell them. Would you help me say somebody? Somebody's got a warning. Oh, yeah, somebody got a So I want to ask you, wherever you are, who's going to tell them? I know it may not seem like this is the main reason why most people live, and that's true. It isn't. But it's one of them. We exist first and foremost to worship the Lord and to enjoy Him forever. And then also to love people like He loves them. And in the process of that, winning them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. To do that, we've got to be willing to live victoriously over the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you're willing to do that, of course, we can't do it on our own, can we? It's going to take the power of the Holy Spirit to get this done. But if we say yes to him, he will do it. He will do it. 
every single day, like you, I also am challenged to say no to the flesh when it wants something that God doesn't want me to have or to look at things through the eyes of the carnal, the understanding of the carnal, or to give in to the constant yearning to be boastful and prideful, but instead to live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, refusing to tempt the Lord or to try to lure God into evil. Hallelujah. And to worship him and him only. That's you tonight. I want to invite you to the table of the Lord tonight. I'm going to pray and then pray a prayer benediction. I'm going to ask you to come from my far left, your far right. If you'll come and if, if I can get you guys to switch spaces just for a moment, thank you. And what we're going to do is I want you to come and this will symbolize the fact that you are willing to resist the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life to move and live in the power of the spirit to be the witness that God wants us to be in 2024 and 2025. Amen? Everybody understand? Father, thank you for your word. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We hide this word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. You have demonstrated and shown us that it's possible to live in a chaotic world and yet live above the influence and the powers of darkness. You called us to follow in your steps. And so this night, we choose to say yes to you. And no to the lust of the flesh. No to the lust of the eyes. No, no to the pride of life. I pray, Father, that in this house, in this house, you would find faithful people. In the name of Jesus, as we stand praying, we forgive those who've hurt us. We forgive those who've harmed us. We let go of every grudge and every ought. And we yield our lives as instruments to your wonderful grace. In Jesus' name. If you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. Come on, if you will, from the far side, just come. Yes, thank you. God bless you. Bless you.